All right, our next talk, we're going to follow up with uh, Marsha Hoffman and Kurt Opsahl. They're going to be talking about legal consideration for cellular research. And I just want to mention again, uh, when you leave the room, be sure and touch your badges at the uh, door so you can fill out the surveys. They'll be emailed to you. And if you have questions on the follow-up, uh, there's a microphone over here in the aisle. Uh, that way uh, you can be on the you know, recording so that everybody listening from home can hear and, uh, and they'll be able to hear you better too as well. Uh, Marsha and Kurt. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you everybody for, for coming. Uh, we're here today to talk about legal considerations on cellular research. A lot of people are interested in doing research on cellular communications, especially uh, with femtocells that now you know you can go onto eBay, you can buy a device that will mimic a cell tower and have it in your house. This makes it an interesting target for, uh, for security testing. Um, so what we're going to talk about today are some of the unique legal considerations that come up in this context. Uh, some of the laws that you're going to be aware of. And the reason for, for this is not to teach you everything that you possibly need to know about this, but to help you with spotting issues and know when to ask for further questions. So this is sort of a, a shallow dive in a very deep ocean. Uh, and the other thing we want to talk about is ways that you can mitigate the risk, uh, ways that you can conduct research which will be less risky than if you didn't know about it. Um, so what do I mean by risk? Risk has a couple of components here, what we're talking about. And so one is practical risk, and the other is sort of legal risk. And by practical risk, this is, you know, is somebody going to sue you? Does it seem like it is threatening enough to make it worthwhile to go to a courthouse and to initiate legal uh, actions? Is it again, threatening to their business model? If you are doing a, as a security research and a, for a presentation in an academic forum that has sort of a lot of uh, what we call atmospherics, this is going to make it sort of a tougher decision for someone to want to sue you because they'll kind of look like a bully. Um, and then the second consideration is, well, what if somebody does sue you? How is that going to look before a court? What is the court going to think about the, the legal issues that have arisen? Um, so there's, of course, a disclaimer. This is not uh, legal advice. Uh, and part of that is about this, uh, not just a, a disclaimer for what we're giving, but to remind you that it's about issue spotting, trying to understand the, the overview so you can look deeper and then ask a lawyer about your specific circumstances. So what makes cellular research a very, very interesting thing? Well, there's a lot of factors that go into what makes it interesting. You have a whole bunch of different devices that are connected to each other that are part of it. So you would have a device which is the phone and connecting to a device which might be a femto cell or a cell tower. And then this is connecting to something at the facility uh, of the telecommunications providers. There's a lot of different players that are involved in this. You have the, the manufacturer of the cell tower, the femto cell. You have the manufacturer of the phone. Uh, you have the person calling, the person receiving the call, uh, the NSA agent listening to the call. Uh, a lot of different people have an interest in this. And they all might have a different reaction to, to the research, depending on whether their aspect of it is sort of coming under, under threat. And then another thing is embedded software. A lot of these devices have software that was perhaps uh, licensed by the device manufacturer, so it's a, yet another party who has an interest in this, and they may claim a copyright in that software. So we're going to give a brief overview of some of the legal considerations, but it's important to note this isn't an exhaustive list. Uh, for example, we're, we're not going to talk about patents or, or trade secrets, even though some of these things may in fact be patented. And, um, and we're not going to talk about wireless spectrum, uh, except to sort of note that uh, it's an issue. Um, so one of the main laws that, that one should be aware of when you're dealing with uh, anything involving uh, telephony, uh, telephony is eavesdropping laws, and that's covering sort of the content of the communication, uh, what people are saying to each other. And there's the Federal Wiretap Act uh, that, you know, this came around from, from the late 60s to regulate when the uh, police can listen to phone calls, but it also regulates when, when others can. Uh, and then each state has their own version of uh, eavesdropping law that has variations. Um, and then you have the pen register tap and trace. And this is uh, for routing and addressing information, the dialed digits. Um, and the Federal Pen Register Act uh, covers how the police would get this and, and prohibitions on, on others. 
Uh, and then, of course, states have their, uh, their equivalents. So some things uh, that might be potential issues is the states will have various laws. You know, 50 states, and they have variations on, on each, and they might treat text, audio, and video differently. Uh, for example, here in Nevada, uh, text messages will be treated slightly differently from uh, phone calls. Um, and some states go so far as to say uh, you need consent to uh, disclose the existence of a communication, uh, as opposed to disclosing the contents of the communication, which is uh, much more widely regulated. Uh, some states have special laws about connecting to telecommunications facilities. So, for example, they might have a, a regulation saying you can't connect to a telecommunications facility uh, with intent to defraud and with intent to not pay the ordinary uh, price. This is sort of trying to deal with the uh, Captain Crunch whistle uh, issue. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, YRF spectrum is outside of this, but if you are broadcasting uh, something over a, a ban on wireless spectrum, that issue is raised. So if you're inspecting packets, if you're looking at the content of the communication that goes by, one of the more important things is, are you in a one-party uh, or all-party jurisdiction? Uh, federal is, is one party, so you're at a minimum in a one-party consent. But many states have all-party consent. Sometimes people call this two-party consent, but that's a little bit of a deception because uh, if there's more than two parties, then you need to get all, all of them to uh, consent. Other things to watch out for, uh, if you're breaking encryption or descrambling, this will raise some issues. Um, and you have laws that are, well, frankly, outdated. A lot of these laws came around, started out in the 60s, where maybe some of them were modified in the 70s. Some of the electronic communication laws came about in the mid 80s uh, with a very different conception of how people were communicating. You know, thinking about like BBSs and, and you know, modern email was not part of the conception there. Uh, they have been modified over the years, but Congress is not very good with adjusting the law to keep up with the speed of technology. Another set of issues, contract laws. You'd be amazed how many contracts that it's going to be asserted that you've agreed to uh, over the course of any given day, but especially in the course of dealing with cellular uh, phones. And, and So you're going to have end user license agreements. You're going to have software development licenses. Terms of use, you have terms of use for your carrier. You have contracts with, you know, involving when you got the phone. Uh, when you got your femtocell, if you did, if you bought it off of eBay, you might have a different contract situation than if you got it from your provider. So check to see how many agreements are going to apply to your research. And keep in mind there are nested agreements. So an agreement may refer to another agreement and say that you've agreed to that as well. Uh, so look through the agreements carefully and you know, you're going to end up with, with a stack of them that you're going to want to uh, review. So what happens if it goes wrong? Well, sometimes uh, you might be in a situation where what you're doing is not uh, kosher under the agreement. Um, and that can lead to a civil claim. They can sue you for breach of contract. Uh, in those cases, you have monetary damages uh, so to sort of make the other contracting party whole uh, for their loss. Uh, and in many circumstances, this is not going to be, you know, sort of a, a tremendous amount of money. But it could mean that, for example, that your account was terminated with uh, your, your cellular service provider. So if it's like your main account, uh, your main phone number that everybody knows you by, that could be a little bit awkward. Um, and then in some places, you have another issue involving with contracts. If you violate the contract, it may implicate computer crime law. And with that, I'll turn it over to Marsha Oppen. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad you came out to our presentation. <clears throat> so. One problem, potentially, uh, with violating a contract that kind of bleeds over into another area here uh, is the question of whether violating a contract like that could uh, make your um, access to a device or a service unauthorized for purposes of uh, the state and federal hacking laws, all right? So the laws that we're talking about here are, first, the, the federal law, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and um, a lot of states have a, a, similar, um, a similar law, uh, and the, the language may be a little bit different, the terms they use may be a little bit different, but the basic idea is generally the same, which is that 
if you are accessing a computer and you don't have authorization to access that computer or you don't have permission or you don't have consent to access that computer, then that is uh, illegal. And um, something that's important about that is that the, uh, these laws generally have uh, civil penalties, meaning that somebody could sue you over this, but they're also criminal laws, which means that you could be prosecuted and you could go to prison. Um, so to give you a sense of sort of the, the problematic language, um, the federal law, here's, here's the, the broadest, most troubling provision uh, of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and the one that um, often is you know, kind of uh, twisted in uh, some concerning ways. Uh, what it prohibits is intentionally accessing a computer without authorization or in excess of authorization, and thereby obtaining information from any protected computer. Now, the way that uh, this law has been interpreted, um, the concept of accessing a computer is extremely broad. And um, obtaining information is also construed very broadly. A protected computer is virtually any computer except a calculator. I don't know why. Congress really very specifically called that out. But the only limiting principle here really <clears throat> is this concept of without authorization or in excess of authorization. And so it's really important for that to be construed narrowly by the courts because otherwise this just turns into this huge sinkhole. Now, Certain people have tried to creatively use that uh, broad language to say that if you access a device um, and breach a contract or violate terms of service when you do that, then that becomes unauthorized access. And what that basically does is turns uh, breaching a contract into something you can go to prison for. And um, I'm not going to get into that a great deal because I'm actually going to do a briefing all about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act right after this in uh, Palace 3. And if uh, you're interested in these issues, please come and we will discuss them to your heart's content. Um, but it's just something to flag um, because uh, you know, this, is, this is something that has uh, really become an issue over the past several years and it's very much an open question. And so anytime we see a situation where somebody is violating a contract, um, you know, at, at first your, your, your thought is, well, it has breached a contract, okay, but then you also have the concern that that could turn into a much more serious problem down the line because of the computer crime laws. Okay, the next legal issue we're going to talk about is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Now, this was a law that was passed in um, the mid-90s. It was sort of intended to update uh, copyright law in light of the new digital uh, content out there on the internet. So two basic prohibitions to keep in mind. The first is you can't circumvent technological protection measures that have been put in place to protect or control access to copyrighted works, okay? The second thing is you can't traffic in tools that are primarily designed, uh, marketed, or valuable for circumventing these technological protection measures. Now, um, the question of what a technological protection measure is uh, is a little bit of a, a, a difficult one. Uh, it's pretty clear at this point that authentication handshakes, protocol encryption, uh, these things would qualify. But then there are a lot of open questions like, uh, you know, code obfuscation, proprietary protocols, do these things count? And if you, uh, if you need to circumvent those things in order to do your research, what does that mean? Um, I will mention briefly that there is a process uh, every three years by which the uh, Library of Congress is able to grant special uh, exemptions to, to basically declare that something, a certain um, uh, circumvention does not uh, violate uh, the DMCA. Um, and in the past uh, several years, EFF uh, has successfully um, petitioned to get an exemption for um, uh, basically jailbreaking or rooting your phone. Um, because we were able to show that a lot of users do that. There are lots of good reasons that people should be able to do that. Um, we tried to get that expanded uh, to tablets and also to video game consoles, and that was, uh, that was not permitted. Um, that is not to say that um, you know, jailbreaking or rooting those devices is illegal, I think. I think what that just means is that there's a lot of gray area there. And frankly, you know, if you need to gain root access to any other computer, if you need to circumvent a technological protection measure in order to do that, there's some gray area there. That's just what that means. So there are some important exceptions to keep in mind about the DMCA and this prohibition on circumvention. 
Um, many people are familiar with the reverse engineering exception. There's an exception uh, for reverse engineering uh, when you are doing it for the sole purpose of achieving interoperability with, a, uh, with uh, uh, achieving interoperability between a program and another program. Um, so this is something that um, actually I think a lot of security researchers know about, uh, but it's important to, to understand that um, it's actually a fairly <laughs> narrow exception that's, um, that's solely for purposes of interoperability. It's not sort of a general all-purpose, you can reverse engineer for anything. There is also an exception for encryption research. Again, this one is fairly narrow. It requires that you make a good faith effort to obtain authorization uh, before you do the research. Um, and so, you know, that's something that might apply in some situations, but it doesn't apply in all situations, certainly. Um, there's one for security testing, but it requires that you have authorization. Um, so again, you know, that's one that might be useful in some situations, but um, it may not be useful for a broad range of security research. There's one that a lot of people don't know about, and I think it's actually potentially really useful. Um, there is an exception um, for uh, circumventing a protection measure that uh, is in a device that is capable of collecting and disseminating personally identifiable information reflecting online activities. And um, this is uh, one that is, um, it, it, it's not often used. And I think a lot of people don't know that it's out there, but it's something that could potentially be useful, I think, in a range of security research. And so um, if you are doing any research that involves devices like that and information collection and dissemination, uh, devices that, that collect and disseminate personally identi identifiable information, you should talk to a lawyer and see if that's something you can use. Okay, so how do we design safer research? Um, based on these, uh, these laws that we're dealing with and the lessons that we've learned, um, the first thing you should do is identify and read any applicable agreements that might apply to the devices or the services you're using before you begin your research. If you can avoid agreeing to them, don't agree to them. Um, one thing that we've noticed over the years is that it is uh, possible sometimes to buy devices off of, say, for example, eBay, and that may uh, uh, put you in a situation where you are not having to agree to, uh, to things that you might have had to agree to if you were buying directly from the manufacturer or from a store. Um, Test on your own devices, accounts, data, communications, if possible, because you are in a position to give consent, right? Um, or get permission to access the device, accounts, data, communications, because again, you give consent, you have permission, you have authorization. Um, crypto, descrambling, uh, bypassing, protection measures, these are sticky areas, and you should talk to a lawyer before you do these things to see um, how you can uh, do them in a way that uh, safely navigates uh, the, the legal uh, craziness there. Um, and when studying other people's code, consider asking permission even if you don't think you'll get it, because um, in situations involving, for example, encryption research, that might put you in a position to take advantage of a DMCA exception where you otherwise wouldn't be able to, okay? So, questions? I think we have a microphone over here if anybody wants to come. Great. Um, I have one, it might be a little bit off. I'm wondering about the uh, legal implications of uh, selling the fruits of our research, the vulnerabilities or exploits as a result of that. The implications of selling. So this is, this is a little bit uh, different for we're trying to hit the, the legal issues of doing the research in the first place, but just sort of to briefly uh, uh, cover that. Um, there are a couple of issues that might arise in the context of, of, of selling uh, research. Um, one to be sort of careful about is sort of the way that it is framed uh, in the sense of uh, if you are you know, taking advantage of an established bug bounty program, that's, you know, that's going to be fine. Uh, if you are going to a provider and saying, you know, I'm, I have a way that will uh, really be damaging to your, your technology um, and you, you need to pay me a lot of money or, or I will uh, uh, publish it, then they might start to feel like this was 
putting undue pressure on them and uh, thinking about like you know extortion or things like that. Which is, I'm not saying that they would have a particularly good claim there, but you don't want to get into a situation where that's where they're thinking it's it's going. Um, and then you know uh, you have considerations about uh, where where to sell it to. Um, you know what, what is know know your customer, know know who you're selling to, and that uh, get someone who you want. I was actually more interested in um, not the the manufacturer, the OEM, but or the bug bounty program. I was more interested in third parties. Into third parties. Um, so I mean, there's a number of, of places that that do this. So I mean, one of the things that, that we thought about is on the you know know your customer end of things. That if you're if you're using it, you don't want to be selling uh, something to someone who's going to turn it into malware uh, to the detriment of people. Um, and there are some places where there are export control laws that will come into play. Um, so there are certain countries that you wouldn't want to um, be selling to. Thank you. Um, is this situation any less bleak for uh, publicly funded academic research? Are there... Sure. Um, go, ahead, go ahead. Well, you know, I think this goes back to the question of atmospherics. Um, I think that uh, if you are a researcher doing you know, publicly funded research, um, uh, or you're an academic, you're an established security professional, I think that uh, those are good atmospherics, and people are probably less likely to uh, create legal trouble for you, right? Um, I think that um, you start to run the risk of attracting uh, attention that you don't want if you are uh, doing research that is not very sympathetic or it doesn't look like you're doing things in the greater good. But um, you know, I think that um, the people who are doing research in an academic vein or sort of a public interesty vein are, are in a much better uh, position as a general matter because you know, regardless of what they of what their research is. Um, you know, they, they are, are people that we want to be doing security research. And I, I think that there are fewer people uh, likely to uh, take issue with it and uh, make a problem for them. Did that answer your question or no? Kind of. I was wondering if maybe there were some legal, uh, uh, if there were extra legal protections of some sort, as long as if you're not making money off of it and publicly uh, disclose so, it. So mean, the, the, the legal protections, where there are some, uh, one place to look at that is in the DMCA research, mm -hmm. but you have to fit within the research exemption. So merely mm -hmm. being academic in and of itself doesn't do it. But if you look at those exemptions, and uh, they have a number of detailed things, and one of, one of the aspects for both security research and encryption research is how the information is presented and whether it's presented in a forum that will sort of enhance encryption or enhance security. Um, and so oftentimes, by sort of you know, happenstance of, of how academia works, it will be in a better position, uh, but it's not in and of itself because it's academic. I understand. Thank you. Can you elaborate on the uh, PII exemption to, um, I guess, research, especially uh, in regards to like mobile handsets, or, you know, mobile phones? Right. I mean, as we were just hearing, they're collecting all kinds of information. Right. And and really, PII would seem to be on most embedded devices now, especially ones that consume. That's purchase. absolutely right. So um, it's actually interesting. I looked at the legislative history of this because I thought, where did that come from? And Congress at the time was mostly concerned about cookies, uh, which I thought was interesting. But I totally agree that if you're doing research on handsets, it could come in very, very handy. Um, it's kind of a long and complicated uh, exception, but, but the basic idea is that if you're studying something, if, you're, if, you, if you have something that um, is capable of collecting or disseminating personally identifiable information that reflects your online activities, that's kind of like a direct quote, reflects your online activities, and you are disabling it uh, uh, because you want to protect your own, um, your own privacy, then you can do that. Um, it is not written to be sort of very general or broad. The idea was that people should be able to protect their own privacy if they want to do that. Um, you know, if you have a particular uh, a research situation and you kind of want to talk through it to see if you're, uh, if you're, if this might apply to what you're doing, we should probably talk about that a little bit later. But it's definitely, you know, something to keep an eye on because I don't know that many people really know about it or take advantage of it. 
Okay, so it's specifically targeted at protecting your own PII. Right, but I do think that a researcher could, you know, be disabling it to protect his or her own personal information or her, his or her own privacy in the course of uh, security research, for example. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Um, we'd really appreciate any feedback if you, if you have it. So if you are, think that we did a particularly good job here, or a particularly bad job here, please go ahead and, um, and submit feedback. We'd really like it. Thanks. Thank you very much.